I don't want to waste the time, your time. Uh, we are here to, to listen to them, to them, and everybody knows them. Go ahead. <laughs> Thank you for your introduction. <laughs> you you was introduced the first day. <laughs> and Palaver is very well known. <laughs> of course, of course. Um, I want to begin uh, by making uh, two remarks and telling a very short joke. The two remarks concern two of my oldest friends in this group, uh, Cesario Bandera and uh, uh, Jean-Michel Guerlain. Guerlain said to us this morning, okay, Guerlain said to me, sorry, Guerlain said to me this morning, said, said to us this morning, um, that uh, your uh, way out of the problems that bring you to therapy are to identify your rival. Right? That's, that's, what he, that's what he said. And so I remember uh, uh, East Aurora, and sitting in Renee's house, having spent three or four days, and, and uh, Renee said, "I found this great guy, who's going to help me write my book. <laughs> He's going to work with me." And then, and then Ugolin walks in the door, and they sit there uh, with with Lefort and and, and Renee, uh, and they find a way of working me into it <laughs> on page 76 of De Jure's Cachet. And I and I realized uh, from what he said this morning that in some way I had, I had identified Hugo Leon as my rival, as my rival for the affection of René. There I was as a student and younger, and of course then there was Hugo Leon with his energy and coming in, and so I I welcome <laughs> I welcome our father together. <laughs> uh, the other uh, the other uh, remark I need to make is if, if Hugo Leon was my was my potential rival, then Bandera was my uncle. <laughs> <laughs> Is Cesario in the room? There, 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 there he is. <laughs> you didn't know that. Uh, I, I, I showed up at, at Jarrah's first lecture, and then uh, uh, Joe Harari arranged for there to be that seminar. And I show up at the seminar, and, and I meet Cesario. And I have to say, and I, I turned to someone, maybe it was even Joe, I said, who is this guy sitting next to me? He seems to know so much. He said, oh, he's the leading light in, in Spanish literature and comparative literature these days, uh, Cesario Bandera. And I have to tell you, I never, ever saw a drop of rivalry between Bandera and Girard. It was absolutely extraordinary. They were the model, even before Schwager, because Schwager came on the scene later on. But before Schwager, this was the model, the, the model relationship of no, a non-rivalrous interaction. And in e every context in which that occurred, it was amazing to me and a source of inspiration. Uh, what I'm saying to you today, uh, I think, can be compressed into a Jewish joke that I like to tell. Uh, it's not really very widely known that during the Middle Ages, uh, the Pope once went. How many of you know this story? Uh, okay, a couple, a couple of you. Okay, so a lot don't. Okay, <laughs> it's, not, it's not very widely known. Some, some know it. Uh, that, that during the Middle Ages, the Pope went to uh, what, what the Pope decided that he needed the land on which the Jews were living. And so he sent the bishop to, to uh, tell the rabbi they would have to move. And the, and the rabbi said, well, we've lived here all our lives. We can't just get up and, and leave. And, and the, the, the bishop said, well, you know, the, the Pope needs the land. I'm sorry, you're going to have to go. And the rabbi said, well, isn't there anything that we can do? He said, well, I guess if you wanted to read scripture with us, you, we could. The rabbi said, we'd love to read scripture. We'll do that. The bishop said, okay, here's the deal. If we'll read scripture, if, if you win, the Jews can stay. If we win, the Jews have to leave. The rabbi says, okay. The day of the debate comes, and the, the bishop goes like that. So the rabbi goes like that. So the bishop goes like that. So the rabbi goes like that. So the bishop takes out a wafer. The rabbi takes out an apple. The bishop stands up and says, the Jews win. The Jews can stay. He goes back to the Vatican. The pope says, what happened? He says, I told him that God is a trinity. He reminded me that there's only one God. I told him that God is all around us. He reminded me that God is within us. I showed him the Eucharist. He showed me original sin. The Jews are our partners. We have to work with them. This is, you know, we need them. <laughs> Rabbi gets back to the synagogue. He said, what happened? He, he told us we have three days to leave the area. <laughs> 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 I, 
I told him not one of us is leaving. <laughs> he said we're going to have to get out of all these regions around here. I told him I'm not leaving this spot. <laughs> they said, what, what happened then? He said, I don't know. He took out his lunch, I took out mine. <laughs> Maybe what we have for lunch may be the issue. Yeah. All right, so I, I've titled my paper, and by the way, my paper is really more about interfaith dialogue than it is about identity, but I think I, I can bring this together at the end of the paper in terms of identity. The title, the title I've given it is The Internet and the After Death, New Approaches to Interfaith Dialogue in the Shadow of Catastrophe. Interfaith dialogue is not what it used to be. The idea of interfaith dialogue was born after the Second World War as part of the liberal democratic humanist thinking and consciousness that was then part of the popular imagination regarding our place in the world in England, Europe, and America. At one extreme, it embraced essentialism, existentialism sorry, uh, as a philosophic position, and at another, it embraced rationalism as a modus vivendi, as a way of going on in the everyday world in the face of dire hardship. The French phrase égalité, fraternité, liberté, which translates roughly equality, brotherhood, liberty, was its secular signpost. And the ecumenism of Vatican II within the Catholic Church was its climactic moment. Things changed a bit in the 60s. Existentialism gave way to structuralism, post-structuralism, again in England, Europe, and America. And the popularity of Sartre gave way to the popularity of Lévi-Strauss. If the sameness, if sameness was the signpost before, the new idea was difference. Diversity was now the cultural byword. And by the 80s, diversity had circulated in all the legal nooks and crannies of our cultural life. In ethnology, psychoanalysis, linguistics, philosophy, epistemological studies of history, Claude Lévi-Strauss, Jacques Lacan, Roland Barthes, Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault dismantled the disciplinary boundaries inherited from Platonic humanism and prepared a new structural model of culture founded on a hypothesis of wall-to-wall -wall textuality and its discernible differential conditions of possibility. I remember specifically uh, a lecture by René Girard that was delivered during this period and that I attended at Stanford University in the 1980s in which he spoke about the bugaboo that ethnocentrism had become and, and rejected the attack upon it by Lévi-Strauss and others who were promoting difference and diversity and who saw in ethnocentrism a scandalous remnant of our humanist heritage that in Lévi-Strauss's view uh, needed to be rejected the way a child's egoistic conception of the universe needed to be rejected to make way for a mature adult interaction to come. What differentiation left out in Girard's view was undifferentiation. As always, René Girard's view was prescient. The idea issued for him from a sense of the central importance of Judeo-Christian Judeo scriptures for reading ancient and archaic culture, an interpretive potential that in his view, non-Christian readers doggedly ignored, thinking as they did that Christianity was just one more myth, and the idea uh, that it was anything more than that was somewhat embarrassing. And that faith, the faith of true believers was the truest, was the, sorry, the faith of true believers was the trust of naive children giving over control of things to others, but that Christian readers ignored as well in Girard's view regarding the central event, not as a mark of personal responsibility, but as the purchase of individual salvation. And he always made that distinction. Then along came 9-11. And you have this wonderful reproduction of the cover that I'm going to now speak about. Uh, you all have this. Take a look at this right Then came 9-11. Art Spiegelman's famous cover of the New Yorker magazine on September 24th of 2001 says it all. Displaying <clears throat> two black rectangular obelisks. And if you look at it, first time I looked at it, there's nothing here. It's just black. If you look at it, there are two rectangular obelisks, right? And you can kind of get a clue to that by seeing that one intervenes in the letter W on the top of the page, right? And then you can kind of use that as a tracer to 
follow the rest of the page and where they are in the page. Displaying two black rectangular obelisks projected against a black, black, black background in such a way that it is impossible to tell whether the twin towers are there or not there. And thus, whether we are viewing an object, or more precisely two objects, off to the right blocking a powerful light source to their right uh, that has somehow cast a shadow that we see before us, or to the contrary, the absence of those two objects, the empty space left by their recent violent removal, the ghostly presence of their absence, so to speak, the magazine cover presents for us the dilemma of 9-11 in all of its complexity. So in other words, we, these are both there and not there at the same time. Uh, it, there, there, it, is, it could be that we're seeing the after effect, the ghostly after effect of the, 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 the towers that were there. Or it could be that the towers are there and the towers are off to the right blocking a sun which is off to their right and so we're seeing the shadow. And there's no way of telling which, which it is. It's kind of interesting, huh? And that seems to me to, to, to mark the complexity of, the, of the, the event. In the movement from one conception to the other, from the black page of the magazine cover where it suddenly dawns us, on us that there are two dark rectangular shapes on the page, to the idea that the shapes are what remain of the Twin Towers after their annihilation, to the further idea that the objects may in fact still be there off to the right, blocking out a powerful light source, so Spiegelman constructs for us in miniature an extension of the event itself, a script for the performance of our own oscillating, uh, of the performance of our own oscillating and ghostly view of it. At once there and not there, the presence of an absence or the absence of a presence. In either case, the haunting, eerie shadow of our legacy of disaster. And in the shadow of these absent twin towers, or more precisely, the, in the shadow of no towers, to use the title of Art Spiegelman's book about them, because that's what he wrote, The Shadow of No Towers. This humanist history that we have been describing, this passage from sameness and humanity to diversity or difference, had to be rewritten. There is an emergency, emer there is an emerging industry now. 9-11 is also means the sign for emergency, right? There's an emerging industry uh, uh, just now that is reconstructing the history of England, Europe, and America after the war, rewriting our conceptualizations of it. At the center of that rewriting is the idea of what I call, uh, after Lawrence Langer, the after death. The word after death is a neologism coined by Lawrence Langer in his writing about our, our errant conceptualizations of the Holocaust, conceptualizations that moved in his view from an endorsement of the endurance of the human spirit in the way we might find it, for example, in the writings of Viktor Frankl or Bruno Bettelheim, to the more sober recognition by French writer Charlotte Delbeau that I died at Auschwitz and nobody knows it, or to the remark by Elie Wiesel upon learning of the passing of Primo Levi that here was proof that one can die at Auschwitz after Auschwitz. But in the field of Holocaust studies, sorry, but the field of Holocaust studies of the past 65 years with an American economy is not hardly the only intellectual arena in which the past is currently being reconsidered. Just a month ago, while I was preparing this paper, uh, a book appeared uh, in the American press by uh, Garrett Graff with the unlikely title, The Continuity of Government While the Rest of Us Die. <laughs> That's the title of the book. And then there was an interview on NPR with that, about that. The book studies the American Cold War nuclear policy in the 1950s and 1960s and the ways in which it was conceived as impacting everyday life in the wake of a nuclear catastrophe. What's interesting from our perspective is the premise that a massive number of people are going to die however you slice the cake and that those who did survive would do so in the wake of their death and in direct relationship to their death. That's the premise of the book. <coughs> or to take one more example, I would suggest to you that the terrorism and suicidal bombing that has taken place uh, in Brussels, Paris, London, Orlando, California, and of course there's been terrorism in, in Spain as well, is premised upon the idea that the fear of one's own death is no longer a guiding or a structuring factor, and that to the contrary, one's own death has become an instrument of that destruction rather than an end to be avoided. 
Once again, I would suggest that René Girard led the way in this discussion, suggesting as he did in his interview in Le Monde just after 9-11, and then later again in his final book, Ashwey Klauschwitz, that a new behavior is afoot in this activity and a new psychology is needed to comprehend it. And in that in the old ways, the old ways of understanding how these terrorist cells operate is for Girard at least no longer applicable. Uh, there is no place here to pursue these ideas further. If we were to do that, we would have to consider at length among the French writers in our analysis, not only Wiesel and Charlotte Delbeau, but also Jean Cairol, uh, Francois Mauriac, Emmanuel Levinas, Maurice Blanchot, Samuel Beckett, among many, many others. For whether there, the theme before us is night, or the Lazarian, or conditions uh, after death, all of these writers say in one way or another, uh, all of these writers, in one way or another, have been exploring the posthumous, the idea that our death is a premise and not a future, and that the entire history of existential thought needs to be reconsidered in their wake. I've tried to do that in, in the recent book that I just published um, uh, with uh, Bloom, Bloomsbury Press that I uh, is entitled Moby and Knight's Reading Literature and Darkness. But what we can say here is that one of the specific byproducts of that rewriting is a change in the idea of interfaith dialogue. And this will be my bringing all this together. What would a Lazarian or posthumous conception of interfaith dialogue look like? Would it invoke the humanity of the other individual? No doubt. Would it invoke the wide diversity of religious and cultural practices and beliefs on the international scene and, and an ancient modern and, and ancient and modern cultural history? Uh, equally, no doubt. Would it invoke the internet? Equally, no doubt. The terrorism of 9-11 or of <coughs> subsequent instances of violence would seem at first glance at least impossible without the availability and the reliability of the internet, this vast new electronic infrastructure, this multifarious complex of cybernetic highways. But whatever interfaith dialogue would look like, we can be sure uh, that it would not rely upon a trust in the effectiveness of dialogue alone or in the triumph of the human spirit of cooperation and rational communication in the face of insuperable adversity. It would not rely upon the famous dictum reputed to have been uttered by William Faulkner in his speech upon being awarded the Nobel Prize that man will endure. Rather than any abstract and uncritical endurance, rather than any persistence in the spirit of survival and being to echo the canatus ascendi often invoked by he Martin Heidegger, it would depend, in my view, upon the acceptance in individual cases of the infinite responsibilities for the other individual. As someone like uh, uh, Emmanuel Levinas describes them for us, and as René Girard, based on the, anal the brilliant analysis given to us this morning by, by uh, Monsieur Hugo Leon, would undoubtedly endorse as well. Uh, responsibilities that exceed the purely survivalist tendencies and that, befall, that, that, and that befall anyone for whom time has stopped, as it has for the characters in Samuel Beckett's most famous drama and uh, for whom the gods, whether existing, no longer existing, or fictional, no longer necessarily play the role they once did within the childlike theodicy in which evil, the evil are punished and justice triumphs. It is not that any of this, faith, dialogue, or interfaith, I want to be very clear about this, not that any of this, faith, dialogue, or interfaith, is bad, but rather that in the context of disaster, in the legacy of disaster that is our inheritance. It may be their unsuspected insufficiency that is highlighted rather than their strength. In other words, that the failure of humanism and ecumenism in the face of the Shoah may not be entirely a matter of external misfortune. In extreme circumstances, our own view of the matter may be implicated as well. The liberal democratic thinking that arose after the war may not have been simply an attempt to return to a pristine, untrammeled past before it was so severely and violently interrupted as we sometimes imagine it to be, but itself already a structure of denial for which it has taken the miniature duplication of the attack against the United States at Pearl Harbor, which is in another way of understanding what 9-11 uh, constitutes for us to recognize. And it may be that in the wake of that 9-11 event, we want to consider whether new understanding of interfaith dialogue is desirable, one that more soberly and more realistically assesses the post-war situation. I have one more paragraph and then we can stop. How can that be done? What would it look like to do so? Uh, in the 1960s and 1970s in America, 
There was a famous self-help group known variously as EST, and then later as The Forum, in which eager young participants gathered for two weekends in a row to meet with Werner Erhard, who I just learned his name was, I think, Jack Rosenstein or something like that. But he called himself Werner Erhard. <laughs> Uh, uh, or with one of his surrogates, in order to interrogate their lives, these people met to interrogate their lives, and to learn to separate knowledge from being and saying from doing. The question with which the inquiry consistently began, and I was there, I took one of these uh, sessions, was, was, was when did you die? When did you die? That was the, the, the question we were asked. And what was always remarkable to me, at least as an interested if more skeptical participant, was the extent to which the interrogated subject assumed without challenge that the question had merit, that he or she in fact had died, and that to understand precisely when and how it happened was of legitimate importance to know in the process. Without endorsing the popular Heideggerianism at the core of this self-help movement, I would suggest that this question, when did you die, continues to have merit as a way of recognizing the extent to which we do live in the posthumous and have done so for most of our lives in England, Europe, and America since the Second World War. And that any conception of interfaith dialogue, regardless of whether that faith or trust be identified as Christian, Jewish, Buddhist, Hindu, Islamic, or con connected with some non-religious affiliation that prizes, uh, that prizes being rooted in the personal responsibility would benefit handsomely from taking into account the full dimensions of our posthumous position. When no remedy is to be had, the best thing may be to give up seeking one, to tell the story of that failure, and like the audience to Beckett's most famous play, simply leave the theater. I only want to remember <clears throat> one thing about Palaver, because he was, um, uh, he's my homologue in, in Innsbruck, but uh, he was um, the president of the Colloquium of Violent Religion. And because of that, I, um, we are all very grateful to you, the service, okay? Go ahead. Yeah. Does it work? Does it work? Yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you very much for uh, the, your invitation and give me the chance to uh, tell all of you a little bit what I was doing the last couple of years. I'm not yet finished, but I try to address the relationship between identity and interreligious dialogue by bringing terror management theory and what, I what that's all about, uh, you will hear in 10 minutes about and mimetic theory complementarily can uh, help us to understand that better. It's not yet finished, it's always risky to bring two theories together, but I think we need all the means to come to, uh, to really understand those things. We are living in a world in which our collective identities are again strongly emphasized, often propelling conflicts between ethnicities, nations, and also religions. The European Union especially is strongly challenged by this tendency. So I will try to uh, go uh, to a deeper anthropological level to try to understand what is at stake. I will start with the challenge that by being humans, we are from our birth onwards challenged by weakness, vulnerability, and mortality. This fundamental human challenge is connected to our longing for collective identities. The more we, we experience the challenge of uh, mortality, the more we are in some way in need of collective identities. And here the problem begins. And it's not hopeless, but we should focus clearly on what is going on here. And do I have a, okay. So what I'm trying to do is uh, reflect a little bit on this connection between mortality and collective identity. I will secondly introduce you to terror management theory. I will thirdly uh, show you a dilemma that happens between our need for psychological security and world views or religions. And then I will show as a possibility of, of roads we can walk. 
uh, how religions today have to combine universalism with pluralism in out for without falling into the trap of relativism. And you will see it is also connected to what one can call positive mimesis. So the first step, mortality and collective identity. Death and violence are deeply interwoven. It's a banality, of course, that violence can lead to death. But it's also going the other way. The mortality awareness may lead to violence against others, and not only may lead to violence, it often does, directly or indirectly. One can refer, for instance, to deep insights by the cultural anthropologist and literary laureate Elias Canetti, who reflected strongly on the survivor. Uh, I quote Canetti, horror at the sight of death turns into satisfaction that it is someone else who is dead. The dead man lies on the ground while the survivor stands, unquote. So uh, many of us do not experience this direct uh, feeling of survivorship of surviving. But when we uh, scan the morning paper, our local morning papers, we have a little bit of this experience also. Canetti refers to that. Uh, the founder, the anthropologist on whom uh, terror management theory is based is Ernest Becker. And Ernest Becker strongly emphasized that we often sacrifice life for more life. Ernest Becker was indirectly also a follower of Freud, although the main insights came out by a profound criticism of Freud without uh, dismissing Freud completely. So we are all, as we already heard in the morning, also uh, students of Freud, even if we have to criticize him. Uh, and in between Ernest Becker and Freud is Otto Rank, and Otto Rank said, Sacrifice, and he is talking really about archaic sacrifice, is one of the human means against death, fear. And uh, in the archaic times, it means collective sacrifice. The group that sacrifices overcomes by this sacrifice the uh, death anxiety. And if you follow these insights of Ernest Becker, you will see, and he has a very broad understanding of religion, so culture, worldviews is broadly understood a religious means, a religious remedy for the death-fearing humans. And he strongly emphasizes, and also the school built on him, uh, rituals and myths. So that's very compatible uh, with mimetic theory. So I can uh, come to my second step. And I will introduce you shortly into terror management theory. Maybe we can, at one of our future conferences, invite some of them, because that's not my own research, so I'm a second-hand reader of them. But I think it's very important what they see. So uh, there, there is a huge number of social psychologists who are doing now terror man management theory. They do it all over the planet. They do it in different cultures, different religious cultures. So it's a huge project going on. And they, uh, the advantage of terror management theory over against us is that they have now done hundreds of experiments. So it's not just uh, cultural anthropology they understand, but they can quite prove something. And if we could prove a little bit more <laughs> mimetic theory in the, in the way they do, I think would, we would benefit. So uh, the three uh, founders, Jeff Greenberg, Sheldon Solomon, and Tom Shishinsky, uh, those uh, social psychologists they just published, published quite accessible book, uh, The Warm at the Core, where they summarize those things in a very uh, publicly accessible way. They are following uh, the anthropology of Ernest Becker, who shares insights with mimetic theory, an emphasis on ritual, an emphasis on sacrifice and scapegoating. So Becker, especially in his book, uh, Escape of Evil, uh, scapegoating, sacrifice, it's from 70. Uh, 
uh, for it was uh, published posthumously uh, is all over the place and in the beginning of cover uh, sometimes Neil Elgi the general secretary of the Becker Society came to our meetings because he also felt there is this uh, interesting uh, uh, complementarity uh, uh, both these uh, approaches also emphasize human rivalry and I think one of the most interesting concepts that was never really explored enough, uh, it was Joao Cesar mentioned it strongly uh, on one of our panels the day before yesterday or yesterday in the morning, uh, lack of being. So when you uh, study mimetic theory and try to find out what is the deeper reason for our uh, longing uh, for a mimetic desire, he refers by drawing on Sartre a lack of being. He doesn't buy into the philosophy that is surrounded in Sartre, but he saw this observation. I think uh, terror management theory can help us to uh, reflect a little bit stronger on lack of being, because I think that the lack of being is strongly connected to our mortality. And uh, that's I will show. And I will start with a very interesting quote in one of the books of Ernest Becker, where he talks about this uh, death anxiety, mortality, and really uh, draws, uh, develops it uh, in a mimetic way in some way without knowing Shira, of course. An animal who gets his feeling of worth symbolically has to minute, minutely compare himself to those around him to make sure he doesn't come off second best. Sibling rivalry is a critical problem that reflects the basic human condition. It is not that children are vicious, selfish, or domineering. It is that they so openly express man's tragic destiny, he must desperately justify himself as an object of primary value in the universe. He must stand out, be a hero, make the biggest possible contribution to world life, show that he counts more than anything or anyone else. So just let's reflect a little bit on this insight into sibling rivalry. I mean, René strongly emphasized the importance of understanding that it's our brothers and sisters who make us uneasy in the very beginning, and we have to learn to deal with that. And it, it remains a, a challenge throughout all your life in some way. Uh, I want to refer to Jonathan Sachs, the former chief rabbi of England. His really absolutely brilliant book and must read, Not in God's Name. He draws on Freud and Girard and says, in order to understand the, the deeper reasons for uh, uh, conflicts in our world of today, also uh, conflicts between different religions is sibling rivalry. He, he, I quote Jonathan Sachs, he writes, it turns out that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam all define themselves by a set of narratives about the factor identified by Girard and felt by Freud to lie at the root of violence, namely sibling rivalry. And then he also says, if you reflect on the relationship between Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, we have to think about the sibling rivalry going, uh, going on, who is the real inheritor of Abraham's promise. And it's this fam family uh, struggle. So sibling rivalry is very important. But we have to make a step further with uh, Ernest Becker to see, because in order to overcome our death anxiety, uh, to become heroes who can uh, face up with that, we have to be part of a mythical hero system. So society, culture, religion, uh, very uh, in a broad way, is seen and understood by Becker as a mythical hero system. And as I will show you in the end, there is no way out of that. So it's more the question, what kind of hero system you are really focusing on, and there are very destructive hero systems, and there might hopefully be hero systems which lead out of the mess. So 
uh, now a summary of terror management theory, building on those insights of Becker. I quote uh, a, a good summary. Terror management theory posits that the unique awareness of death renders human beings prone to debilitating terror, and this, that this terror is managed by a dual component anxiety buffer consisting of a cultural worldview and self-esteem. In support of this analysis, experiments have demonstrated that this positionally high or momentarily raised self-esteem reduces uh, physiological and self-reported anxiety in response to a variety of threats, and that mortality salience produces a host of exaggerated positive responses to those who share or uphold one's cultural worldview, and exaggerated negative responses to those who are different or who violate important aspects of one's cultural worldview. So uh, terror management theory shows us that death anxiety forces us to cling stronger to our religion, to our worldview, derogating very often the others. And I think now comes a very important, important um, overview, and I can go very quickly through it. Uh, it is, uh, was developed by uh, two uh, German-speaking uh, social psychologists, Jonas and Fritsche, and they wrote a brilliant paper on escalation and de-escalation of violent intergroup conflicts based on this. And if you just uh, focus on the, uh, on the white part, so on the uh, left part, uh, uh, from A, B, C, D, the beginning is existential threats, and think about our world today, terrorists attacks, anxiety because of the refugee crisis and other things, heighten uh, the death awareness and uh, the, the threat anxiety. So that's A, leading to the defense of social in-groups and cultural worldviews. Uh, many people now turn to be more strongly Christian. They don't go to church, but they feel now more strongly <laughs> related to Christianity, and they have troubles with Islam. And the other way, it's also on the other side, all over the place. This defense of social in-groups and cultural worldviews easily leads B to intolerance toward different others, derogation of outgroups. This distinction between we and them. And if you have an intolerant view of the other, hostile behavior in violent social conflict is increasing, leading to more threat. So it's a, a very dangerous cycle. But unfortunately, uh, fortunately, uh, if you now see to the fields of the gray thing, and all those things, it's a summary of hundreds of experiments. Really experiments done with Christian, with Muslims, believers, non-believers, Hindus, and so on, uh, there are possible buffers. So if the perception of threat is understood in a worldview that overcomes those death anxiety, intolerance and violence is de-escalating. If there are symbolic immortality strategies to, that do not increase intergroup conflict, it's also helped. And pro-social action in line with salient cultural norms and overcoming us versus them also helps. And you can improve when a, when a worldview emphasizes those elements. They are real strong buffers. And so people do not go into this negative cycle, but can break it. And I will uh, let me be surprised myself. Yeah, I <laughs> just summarized the positive thing. And I, it's not only religion that's a buffer, worldview in a very broad sense, but I want to reflect on religion. So uh, the summary of the positive side by Jonas and Fritsche, they say, research on terror management theory suggests that mortality silence Salience does not necessarily result in conflict and intolerance, often it does, but not necessarily, but can also foster positive tendencies such as intergroup fairness or approval of pacifism depending on how existential threat is perceived, whether the need for symbolic self-transcendence is satisfied, which social norms are salient, and how social situations are interpreted. 
So religion can be an important buffer where religion helps us to overcome death anxiety and this uh, threat is uh, part of a larger uh, worldview that uh, really results, as the experiments show, in a less intolerant behavior towards the other. Also, religions, worldviews who emphasize peaceful norms like tolerance or nonviolence result. So a, a committed, religiously uh, convinced pacifist is not automatically led to a intolerant behavior towards other groups. So the, 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 the first experiment they did, I think I should uh, tell that, was they had a group of, uh, of judges. And they separated the group of judges in two groups. One group, when they did the judgment on a, a screen, they were exposed to uh, 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 images of a good life. And the other group was exposed to death destruction. And uh, they had to result, uh, they had to judge a minor case of prostitution. The average uh, fee, uh, the, the group with the good images was $50, the other group $500. So when you're exposed to death, uh, you, that's what they also tell us, you are more likely to scapegoat, you are more likely to follow friend enemy patterns. So that, that's the result. Uh, so, it's also important to have a worldview overriding divisions between us and them. Becker says, we need a heroism of sainthood. He, re he refers as one example to Francis of Assisi, a founding father of interreligious dialogue. But uh, uh, I have to, uh, we have to face also a dilemma when they reflect in the end of the book, uh, the psychological uh, crisis we are in, they say, we, we can generally have, uh, uh, can distinguish two, two worldviews. The worldview of the rock is black and white, claims absolute truth for your own group, and gives strong psychological security. If you are a narrow-minded Christian, you are in this field. If you are a narrow-minded Muslim or a secularist, you are in this field. But this worldview of the rock with this clear-cut black and white worldview easily results and inflames intergroup conflicts. The other, the other group uh, they call the hard place, worldview of the hard place, and you see they play with between a rock and a hard place. This is a dilemma. The other accepts ambiguities, accepts uncertainty, not that clear cut uh, black and white, uh, accepting grayish zones, gray and it's more tolerant against the others. So they summarize this, summarize this dilemma. We need to fashion worldviews that yield psychological security, like the rock, but also promote tolerance and acceptance of ambiguity, like the hard place. And so in my final step, I would uh, try to show with a very short example from Judaism, Islam, and Christianity, uh, that we in our uh, Abrahamic traditions and also in others, but I will focus just on those three, we have the capability to, we have in the tradition those things, and I would like to emphasize that. I don't say this is everything you can say to those religions, but two examples, true, th true <coughs> thinkers who are able to combine universalism with pluralism, give the people a security without saying it's only one way, one type, uh, one truth, and so on. The political philosopher Michael Walzer reflected strongly on potentials in this direction in Judaism, and he uh, distinguishes between a covering law universalism, and covering law universalism means, and we all heard that, a covering a law, universalism, is uh, a society, a worldview, one salvation, one messiah, one millennium for all humanity. So it's black and white a little bit. There is only one way, the others are bad. But he said in the Jewish tradition, there is not only this covering law, universalism, with its imperialism, there is also a reiterative universalism. So even in the Bible, you see, it's not just the Jewish people have been saved from the tyrant in Egypt, there were also other, other people who had another way, a similar way, but another way. So he, re he refers 
uh, among other things, to Amos 9.7, Are you not like the Ethiopians to me, O people of Israel, says the Lord? Did I not bring Israel up from the land of Egypt, and the Philistines from Kaftor, on, and the Arameans from Kir? So you see just in this passage, there are several types. And this is important, universalism and pluralism. And there is another example in the Muslim tradition, uh, Reza Shah Qasemi, uh, a London-based Muslim scholar. He was at the uh, cover conference in 2009, and he wrote a book on interreligious dialogue, The, one, the Many in the Light of One, in which he strongly argues against relativism and how important it is to bring pluralism and universalism together. And he shows quite some surahs and verses in the Quran which go in that direction. I take it now just one as an example. It's the famous verse 48 in the Shura 5. And uh, here we can read the following. And unto thee have we revealed the scripture with the truth, confirming whatever scripture was before it, and a watcher over it. So judge between them by that which Allah hath revealed, and follow not their desires away from the truth which has come unto thee. For each we have appointed a divine law and a traced out way. Had Allah willed, he could have made you one community, but that he may try you by that which he has given you. He had made you as you are. So why one with another in good works? Unto Allah ye will all return, and he will then inform you of that wherein you differ." Unquote. So this passage just says, if God would have been made uh, humanity one, one monolithic group, he could have done it that way. But he didn't. <laughs> so each group, each religion should follow its own way. And they should, in a positive emulation, vying with another in good works, aiming for the transcendental, transcendental good that doesn't bring us automatically by imitation into envy and destruction, but may bring out the best out of each of our own tradition. It's a very important uh, example of positive mimesis. Two days after the Regensburg speech, I was at the interreligious conference, Christians, Muslims, in York, in Middle England, and uh, Reza Shah Qasemi just explained this passage. I was sitting there and said, I mean, this is mimetic theory. I have to study that more, and afterwards I did that. The third example, and I will conclude uh, soon, uh, is a, a Catholic thinker, which is which was, uh, he's still alive, but now old man, but he's a, a key figure in the Catholic approach towards interreligious dialogue. He uh, wrote one of the important pieces commissioned by the Vatican Interreligious Commission on Dialogue between Christians and uh, Muslims. He is one of those leading thinkers who were also very influential uh, during and after the Second Vatican Council to develop a Catholic theology that was able to combine universalism with pluralism. I am talking about Maurice Bormann, a French-born uh, uh, member of the Order of the White Fathers, who was teaching in the pontifical uh, institution in Rome that focuses on Quran and Islam. And in 1981, he was commissioned to write guidelines for the dialogue between Christians and Muslims. And he very strongly emphasizes this spiritual emulation, as he calls it, as the way uh, Christians and Muslims should deal with one another. Just to clips, clips uh, short insights, but th those are very central for him. Muslims and Christians should, see, should seek to excel each other in good deeds of faith, such as the promotion of life, justice, and peace, the defense of human rights, in all of which they acknowledge the greatness of God, giving him the honor which is his due. Or in a, another section where he directly refers to Surah 548, believers in dialogue engage in a holy spiritual emulation. <laughs> uh, 
<laughs> emulation in which they vie one with another in good works. If you just want to uh, see the, 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 uh, what were the results of this work of uh, uh, Maurice Bormann's in 1985, uh, John Paul II gave a speech to young Muslims in Morocco, a very important speech, in which he again took up this idea. So John Paul II said the following, Christians and Muslims in general, we have badly understood each other, and sometimes in the past we have opposed and even exhausted each other in polemics and in wars. I believe that today God invites us to change our old practices. We must respect each other and also we must stimulate each other in good works on the path of God. And my final uh, sentence or my final minute, I would like to address you to the uh, uh, paper, the letter, a common word that was written after the Regensburg speech by 138 Muslim scholars to all the leaders of Christian churches. And uh, this letter, a common word, uh, finishes with uh, Surah 548. So it's really a, a key passage. And before they quote the Surah, the verse you already know, they r uh, wrote the following. So let our differences not cause hatred and strife between us. Let's vie with each other only in righteousness and good works. Let us respect each other, be fair, just, and kind to another, and live in sincere peace, harmony, and mutual, mutual goodwill." Unquote. In view of mimetic theory, we have to affirm this appeal because only a good emulation provided by God can help us to overcome the dead ends of mimetic rivalry. Thank you very much. So questions? Any? Yes, thank you very much. Um, Renee's concept of uh, ontological sickness the, the longing for the being of the other. If you could elaborate on that, because he didn't seem to elaborate much. He sort of hit upon it and then did not pursue it, I don't think, but I'd, I'd like to hear more. But also in this uh, wider context, um, sacrifice as oblation, you know, reciprocal thank you. you give us life, we give you life, we sacrifice life. But sometimes there's this negative aspect of sacrifice. It's not oblation, but elimination. So getting rid of the sick person, uh, or the lowest on the... So why do you want to give the most imperfect thing to God? Why would you sacrifice the sick, the women, the children, or the most vulnerable? Why, why would you do that? And in that sort of, uh, those, those two contexts, how does that affect how people understand the, the obligation to, uh, it seems there's, there's conflict there. So, thank you. Immediately? I, I, yeah, I mean the, the first part, ontological sickness or the, the deeper reasons for lack of being. I was, when I was writing my book on Shira, I was really struggling for months with this chapter. And it was Charles Bellinger who helped me a lot to clarify it in that sense, because uh, René took the term lack of being, it's manque d'être, uh, the French expression. It's a famous expression of uh, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre in his book, uh, Being and Nothingness. And for, for, uh, for Sartre, the lack of being is already the other. I mean, if I would be alone in the world, uh, everything I see, I see nobody disturbs me. For Sartre, if someone enters, already the space <laughs> and the view, everything changes, and this disturbs. And, and Sartre, of course, ends up with saying the other is the hell. So uh, uh, Sartre, in some way, a very keen observer, but in the end, because of his 
uh, individualism uh, and his solidarity uh, few, he ends up in an ontology of violence uh, for which Shura was often accused of, but I think that it doesn't really uh, fit uh, with, with mimetic theory. So my, my understanding of lack of being was then later on by comparing a Sartrean view with Kierkegaard's view. And Kierkegaard, of course, said, we are creatures. So therefore, creatures means we are not perfect, we are not, uh, we are not God, we die, we die, we get sick, we are vulnerable. And so there is always the, the longing for perfectness. And if you read, for instance, Becker and those things, you see that uh, because of this vulnerability, we become fans of dictators, we become fascists, we become uh, jihadists, whatever. You, you see a group that probably then becomes so absolutely perfect that it overcomes our own weaknesses. And the Christian, sh sh uh, the religious solution, and in the Christian tradition, for instance, is accept that you are a creature. So we don't have to be perfect, and we have to understand ourselves as creatures who are pilgrims in this life, and who will get a final, uh, a final completeness in some way in the end. So that can uh, solve that problem. And if you then read Schwarz's uh, work, uh, Mimetic Theory, carefully, you see that fits very well. So I don't think that Mimetic Theory is not in touch with it, with this insight of understanding ourselves as creature. Look again at to Sartre. For Sartre said, if I am a creature of God, I am already dependent. I mean, I don't want to be dependent. He wants to be self-sufficient. But this of self-sufficiency is the beginning of the problem. And well, today we, we all are always again and again tempted uh, to become self-sufficient. I was just at a very good paper uh, by Jean-Marc Baudin, Baudin, who I think referred uh, strongly in the, also in that direction. But maybe we have to do more work on, on lack of being. The other, the other question, uh, I mean, if, if we long for perfection in this world, if we do not uh, really, uh, if we really are challenged by mortality, vulnerability, sick and weak people are more easily sacrificed because uh, we want to get rid of them. We want to be uh, uh, in, invuln uh, invulnerable. Mm. You like to add Yeah, yeah, I would like to, uh, I mean, there's also another side to the question uh, of the Sartre raises, which is coming out of the Heideggerian uh, issue, which is uh, whether or not uh, ontology is fundamental. Uh, it, it may be that, uh, in light of what we heard this morning, that responsibility uh, precedes the ontological, uh, and that the case could be made for ownership of responsibility prior to uh, engaging whether um, being has a fullness or, or is, is empty. Uh, and this, this is, of course, is one of the, the primary projects of, of Levinas. So there, there's another, that's another alternative to thinking the ontological. Yeah. Uh, okay, let's have you. Uh, I would simply like to point out a couple of things. First, when we talk about uh, Girard's mimetic desire. Uh, when we talk about Girard's mimetic desire, or uh, when he said that human desire is mimetic, he means it in a universal way. In other words, it's not that he has discovered that uh, humans are, uh, human desires are mimetic. The, the, the uh, Madison Avenue advertisers knew that a long time ago. You know, everybody knew that. You know, it's like um, Newton's law of gravity. Everybody knew that apples <laughs> fell from trees. <laughs> you know, uh, Aristotle talked about, you know, the, what he discovered is the universality of this. In other words, if you are a human being, your desire just beyond the, uh, the realm of, of animal necessity 
is mimetic. Okay? And now, um, in, if we put this in a biblical uh, sense, the, second, the title of the second chapter of Mansonge Romantique uh, in English is Men Will Become <coughs> Gods to One Another. You know, I mean, this is the devil's promise, tricky promise, you see? Eat of the forbidden fruit and, uh, you see, you will become like God. This is why God does not want you to taste of that. You see, it brings already the, the element of rivalry. Adam and Eve already want to be like God but they're going to be like God to one another. That's another universal law. There's nothing we can do about it, okay? So, the, you know, the choice is the model, you know? You are going to follow a model. There is nothing you can do about it. You know, you may rebel against it, you may, but, but this is, you know, if, if we believe <coughs> giraffes. So, so the only question is, you know, so uh, yes, uh, Girard was, um, uh, he acknowledged uh, a little bit of a Sartre on himself, you know, when he go in Paris, that, that was the big thing, okay? But I think we, when we turn this into too much of a philosophical, uh, ontological lack of being, um, maybe that's not the proper expression. You know, it is simply that, uh, may I mention another, Romano Guardini <coughs> talked about um, God in paradise giving Adam uh, this extraordinary, you know, be the ruler of this, of the earth, you know. Um, you are like no other animal, okay, granted. I am granted a human being, um, a dignity, a self-sufficiency, an autonomy that no other animal had. So what's the fall? The fall is precisely the loss of that autonomy. You see, the, the devil turned the thing around so that, you know, it made that autonomy impossible. And that's what the fall is. Well, whether we want to philosophize about lack of being and so on and so forth, I, I don't know. I don't know if that helps. Can I, can I uh, make a response? Uh, one of the places that he, that Girard finds that quote, men will become gods to each other, is Max Scheler. And the other part of the sentence has to do with idolatry. So it's actually a critique of idolatry. And it's not, a, it's not even an engagement. You're, you're right. It's not an engagement with beings. It's an engagement <coughs> with idolatry, which is, of course, central to the Hebrew Bible. Uh, and it's it's and then of course after he wrote that book, he had another book in which he even f focused even more fully upon the question of idolatry, which was the book on Dostoevsky, uh, which was written uh, uh, I think it was called Du Double à Unité in French, if, I'm not, if I remember correctly. Uh, and the, and, this, and the question of idolatry was at the center of that. So Rene was very aware. Uh, so so he only when he used the notion of being. It was in a very limited way, and never, to my knowledge, in the Heideggerian Canatus Ascendi way, which mm -hmm. is well, what I think the error that we fall into, and why I felt uh, uh, that it was so important for what Ugarleon said this morning, uh, that we there's a compatibility uh, between an, an ethical perspective that, that talks about ownership of responsibility uh, and uh, where it, where it is that I find myself, uh, and and uh, I, I think the case is, is is made for the ethical. I mean, we we spoke a little bit here, and, and of course in introdu introduction too about the question of positive mimesis. We all positive mimesis are, is encouraged by Rene. I mean, he said il faut refuser la, la violence. I mean, but it, the, but how we refuse la violence is left open. Do we do it by the law of anti idolatry? Do we do it by um, reading Ernst Becker, do we do it by becoming a good Muslim? Do we do it by, you see, I mean, th that remains an open question. And if it, if it didn't remain an open question, then 
he would be his his thinking would become dogmatic and then uh, self-exclusionary as a result of that. So that's why I want to insist that, uh, and I'm, Duncan Morrow and I have been having this disc ongoing discussion during the conference, I want to insist that Girard leads us to the door of the ethical, of the positive or negative mimesis, but, but leaves open it, the door for us to choose how we find an ethical um, a system, and w one might be to turn to Levinas, another might be to turn to uh, Judaism, another might be to turn to South, or, or, or uh, some might want to make the case that Heidegger is, 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 has, a, has, a, has a richer perspective on thing. I wouldn't be the one to make that case, but others might. Uh, in any case, uh, yeah. yeah. Any one of those, whether it is uh, uh, Levinas or Sartre or Heidegger, uh, those are still human. That is still the other. I think uh, when Girard speaks of, um, of either vertical transcendence or deviated transcendence, the only model that takes you away <coughs> from the river, it's a model with which you cannot rival. A, a model that is beyond your possibility of being a rival with. You know, therefore, it would have to be a transcendent thing. Mm -hmm. For Christians, of course, that is Christ. Mm -hmm. Or a Jew, it may be God himself, you know. I don't know what it would be for a, for a Muslim. Uh, you know, God, I showed. You know, the God of Abraham <laughs> or, 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 you know, Muhammad. I don't know. You know, but it will have to be a transcendent model. Mm -hmm. It cannot be. It cannot be another one of us, mm -hmm. no matter how prestigious. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, that, 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 that is crucial. Mm -hmm. that is crucial I, I would like to underline what you just said, because if you uh, I didn't uh, explore it enough, if you see what uh, the Muslim tradition or what Maurice Bor Bormans emphasized by this spiritual emulation, this is an emulation where the aim and the good ultimately is a transcendent good. You, you can see that already in Augustine. Augustine uh, uh, distinguished between, I mean, for the whole tradition, the Western tradition, uh, the distinction between destructive envy and good emulation was essential. But the precondition to make this distinction was the distinction between temporal goods and it, yes. eternal goods. And Absolutely. that's, yeah, yes. and that's very Im uh, important. and was yeah. emphasized by, by the spiritual emulation that I showed you shortly. Yeah. Mm? Yeah. Short and concrete question. <laughs> um, so then, then the question to Wolfgang, uh, because there's that project you presented of introducing psychology to interreligious dialogue. And I there are two kinds of tensions. First, there's a tension between psychological understanding and spiritual understanding of death. And they are, I think, to totally different. Uh, in Christian uh, uh, tradition, we face death to convert. And this is what Girard uh, spoke about. So deathbed conversion, that was very important for him. So he would look at death in a completely different way, uh, not, in, not in a psychological way, but in a spiritual way. So this is the first kind of tension. And the second type of tension is that when we are thinking about psychology, uh, this is about statistical um, uh, formulas. Whereas they draw on anthropology where the figure of hero is very important and of saint. And a saint is somebody who is against statistical uh, formulas. So he, 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 he can surprise us. He can go against uh, uh, our expectations. So I think that when we are referring to psychology, there are certain costs. Uh, and then uh, we have to deal at least those two tensions. There will be much more, but th I would like also to thank Sandy for all, all your beautiful presentations. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, first of all, uh, I mean, everything <laughs> what we do has benefits and, uh, and shadows in some way. But I, I think, and I, uh, there is an interesting compatibility again between er Ernest Becker and René Girard. And I think it's very important for our own world. Uh, 
Ernest Becker's anthropology is deeply uh, spiritually underpinned, so it's not by chance that he refers in the end to the canticle of the son of St. Francis. And also, as I read, uh, many of those who are doing uh, terror management theory, you feel they are believers in some way. So they, uh, it's not a separation between uh, spirituality and psychology, it's a social psychology. Uh, 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 Ernest Becker died very young, he only uh, went 50, and when he was terminally ill, he was interviewed, there is a marvelous interview with him uh, about the whole theory and so on, he, d he died I think a uh, month later, and uh, the, the guy who inter interviewed him asked him, what do you think about uh, Paul Dillich, the famous theologian, and uh, Becker said, well, he is too quickly a theologian. And we have to do today in our world anthropology until our anthropological work forces us to take the step into theology. And I think René did the same. He referred several times to Simon Weiss' insight that the gospel is not a theology and it's an uh, anthropology. And I think some, I, I myself uh, am a theologian, but uh, I think in our world of today, especially in the Western uh, world, and where many people do no longer understand the, the value of the spiritual tradition and theology, theologians, if theologians just jump up and give their good theological answers, they give answers to questions that haven't been asked. So therefore, we really have to do anthropology until the anthropology or social psychology forces us to go a step deeper. And I think that's uh, the modern world forces us to be a clever apologist of that type. And therefore, I uh, recommend very much that, that way I, I, I proposed. Would you like to say? Uh, I actually would like uh, to address something that, that uh, uh, Cesario said, which is the question of deviated transcendencies. Uh, uh, and it raises for us a, 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 an issue that's been circulating uh, in our discussions and, and certainly in my own mind, which is how you, ch how you choose a model. I mean, this was raised also this morning. How you choose a model, and we, is, is a model automatically a given? And you, you asked this question directly, Cesario, when you said, uh, you know, Rene regards uh, Jesus as a help, and, and it seemed in some way you were almost scandalized by that. You wanted him to be doing something more than just turning to him as a help. And I, th I think in some ways that it's because, and I've said this at a conference that, uh, 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 to which uh, uh, I was invited by Wolfgang, uh, I, th I think in some ways Girard is Jewish. And, and what I mean by <laughs> making that statement <laughs> is that he's taken uh, as his model, Jesus, who's, who has taken as his model, Isaiah. When, when, uh, when Jesus talks about the prophet, he, he specifically refers to Isaiah, and he, in some way he's modeled his life on the, 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 a variety of texts, among, one of the most powerful being 52, 53. Uh, of Isaiah, I mean, there are other texts like Genesis 22 and and story of Joseph and you know, give her, give her our, 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 our daily bread and so forth. Uh, but I but I th I think it's important that that uh, that that be acknowledged that in some ways he's making a move that to me is not upsetting that that makes for him Jesus like the novelist that he was reading just prior to that. In other words, he was reading Stendhal and he was reading uh, Flaubert and, and Dostoevsky, and he was seeing them as, as doing a certain kind of research, not simply gods, but doing a kind of research. And then he thought, okay, they, they have discovered Jesus. So he will do the same kind of research. He reads Jesus as a kind of novelist, a novelist of the world in some sense, in which Jesus' model is the transcendent and non-deviated transcendent, namely Isaiah. Does uh, I? Yes, okay. more questions. Uh, there are a lot of questions. Uh, okay. Three more, but I, short. Um. I would like to ask uh, one more question about the, the connection between Ernest Becker's work and Girard's work. Um, Ernest Becker's immor heroic immortality immortality projects. He considers them as uh, a compensations for for the awareness of death. Mm -hmm. um, but you could also look at the, the relationship with 
with the other. I mean, the terrorist is the one who doesn't, who does not want to get killed or eradicated by his enemy, and therefore he is prepared to sacrifice himself, to kill himself. And like the 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 patriot is the one who doesn't want to get killed by the the. Uh, the terrorist, and so he is prepared to to kill himself, to sacrifice himself for his country. So you have this kind of mimetic rivalry, um, and I, I was wondering, in mimetic rivalry th that uh, generates uh, an immortality project. Mm -hmm. And I was wondering if uh, Ernest Becker's work also touches upon uh, th this kind of rivalry, um, or if he just remains at the level of uh, like uh, a lack of being uh, m in the sense of uh, uh, being mortal. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no. Uh, I, 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 I think what you just summarized you can find in in Becker's work and also in in many articles by people committed to terror management theory. So they they show. I mean, the interesting thing is. Uh, there are different ways uh, how we how human beings overcome the lack of beings. We buy a lot of things. Or some of my friends know I uh, I try to go ten thousand steps every day, so run away from this. <laughs> or uh, to write uh, 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 the the Hauptwerk, the the major the major <laughs> book, <laughs> in order that at least one can think in twenty years. Uh, after my death, that book is read, or to have a lot of children, and so something is going on, or to be part of a big nation or a big religion will, which will remain, and so people are even ready to sacrifice themselves in order that the world view or the nation remains. So there is a lot to explore in in the direction you. Uh, it's it's my feeling. What you said, you can find there, and maybe we we have to do more work to show the to strengthen the compati uh, compatibility. I've never dared so far to do that because it's always tricky because the people said uh, mimetic theory for our group is enough. We don't need other things. <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm a, from my deep nature, bridge builder. I think we should build bridges wherever it's possible. Um, you yeah. And you, uh, if you are, uh, well, okay. um, before coming here, I was reading a lot of um, uh, a lot of authors about um, identity, and all of them concluded that uh, identity is about being different from the others. Uh, uh, and then we we have been building a lot of traditions. Traditions also are also invented. Religion too. Religion is a cultural device religion not God religion is an invention and uh, which uh, affirms the or that uh, exalts the um, the difference with the others then uh, there is Girard saying that uh, the big terror uh, uh, for for humankind is uh, the undifferentiation so uh, I was wondering if uh, in all these um, Renouncing to uh, religion wouldn't be a better way to um, stop violence. Mm -hmm. When you add religion to any discussion, it would be a mess. Uh, so uh, I don't know how does it fit, since uh, the, the topic would be a, a identity and interreligious dialogue. Good I mean, uh, you are right uh, that most of the time identity is created over against the other. But it's not necessarily so. It's not necessarily so. So the, the, these experiments show that there are worldviews who can overcome that. One of the most famous Catholic theologians, Henri de, de Lubac, uh, in his book Catholicism, says, if you understand if you understand Catholicism properly, Catholicism does, does not need an other to define itself. So he was rejecting the concept of closed society as it was, uh, was uh, conceptualized by Bergson 
and it's very uh, close to a rejection of Karl Schmitt's political identity. Uh, I'm, I'm currently reading very eagerly St. Francis of Assisi, and I think when he even went so far to talk about uh, cosmic fraternity, not only other human beings, everything, uh, we are all brothers and sisters because there is one God, uh, he talks about an identity that does not fall into the trap of identity that needs an other to define oneself, because there is an other on another level, transcendence again, God. So that's very important. And I, I would say, uh, if we say, let's get of religion, because religion always cre create this kind of us versus them uh, cleavage. Of course, there are very uh, there are many examples in history and today when religion does that. But not only religion, also nationalism, also ideology. So Ernest Becker would say, if you get rid of religion, you get probably even uh, more terrible pseudo religions. I mean, think about uh, the millions of dollars that are now spent in in Silicon Valley by by Calisco, a sub sub-company of Google to uh, overcome death uh, immediately. Even our generous friend Peter Thiel is giving more money to this project than, than, than to uh, uh, support of mimetic theory. Uh, think about that ideology. What does it mean? Uh, maybe, maybe we can really make big progress and some people uh, can become 300 years old. It will for a long time be for a very small group who can uh, can li live longer, and the rest will will die. It will it will be a terrible way of uh, splitting uh, us versus them. But of course, uh, what you addressed is one of the uh, real challenging questions we have to face. How can we have identity without uh, needing someone else to uh, uh, be against? Yeah, and I. I mean, I agree with Wolfgang, and what I tried to to do, uh, I didn't um, expand upon it, but what I tried to do was, was to think about some of the new ways in the wake of the violence of the 20th and 21st century that we might assure ourselves of our own existence. If, if, if we don't drive our identity from others, then uh, how do we derive it from ourselves? We know traditionally there have been a number of ways. I think, therefore I am, or I, I feel uh, Descartes, or, or I feel, therefore I am, the Romantics, or God exists, therefore I am, the Scholastics, uh, or I suffer, therefore I am, the ancient Greeks. <coughs> uh, but I, I propose that, in, that the, a cogito that would be sufficiently authentic after uh, disaster might be, I died, therefore I am. I died, therefore I am.